Okay, we're studying tensors, and you may have Googled around and found that tensors are attached to an enormous number of things. There are neural network software systems that are named with the word tensor, where they have tensor prominently featuring on the first page of their documentation. There are examples by various bloggers that describe tensors that seem pretty straightforward, grids of numbers. However, this is a misunderstanding of what it is to be called a tensor and what it means to have that extra designation above just being a grid. While it's true that any grid of numbers could be manipulated like a tensor, you will lose all sense of understanding in your data science if you choose to attack it this way. So let's take a look at some examples which seem to be tensors in the naive sense, but in order to actually be tensors would require quite a nuanced idea. So to begin with, I want to just look at the simplest example of data, something like a table. A table in this case of schedules for when a bus reaches a route. We take this flex route and we see where the various top stops are and the times at which it arrives. Values that are empty we'll consider as zero. We could ask this question, is this a matrix? In one sense, it is. You can actually store this as a matrix data structure. Nothing will prevent your program from doing so. But let's ask ourselves if this is meaningful. If we were to reorder the rows or columns of this table, would anybody be served? What value is it to put this out of order? The stops come in a specific order. To ruin that order would make the person confused. To change the times would also be difficult to scan. It doesn't seem to add any value to reorder. What about rescaling? This is another thing we do classically in the first stages of multilinear algebra. We rescale a row and column of a matrix whenever doing Gaussian elimination and other techniques. But rescaling would certainly lead to mostly nonsense. Why would you ever rescale the time of day? Why would you rescale one particular station? These are not relevant. And likewise, we never take linear combinations of any two rows or any two columns. It seems that this type of data, while encodable as a matrix, is resistant to any kind of linear algebra. It therefore really ought not be called a matrix. It communicates something. When we say something is a matrix, we are elevating it to the understanding that linear algebra is a relevant tool, and it clearly isn't in this example. Let that be a lesson about what we mean when we start giving the name of tensor to various types of data. While we can do so, we may actually lead to just simply confusing the people using it. There might be simpler understanding to be had about the data you're actually after. Let's see this in more examples. I have here a crude uh, grade book. You could think of other spreadsheets that you collect data on. What we could have here is a list of users, or a list of participants, or in this case, a list of students. The students here are named, and each one has been given various grades. The grades are all created at random for this example, but the premise is that they're collecting values that we've assessed based on some particular point scores. Certainly, there'll be examples where the scores are different. But as we grade with various assessments, we might have different point values. So one might be out of more points or less points. It makes sense to rescale to say, put them all on a 100 point scale. Rescaling is very relevant. We also find that there's really no need to put the homeworks in in any particular order. We often shuffle that information around, maybe sorting the higher value points to the front. We can also remove homework scores. We can have students drop out. These are manipulations that we do often. We can even do linear combinations. Think, for example, of an average of a score. That simply takes the linear combination of a sequence of other scores and weights them as well. It is naturally a linear combination. So it hopefully is evident at this point that if we do column operations, we are in fact seeing the information in a linear way. The rows, however, do not let us do as much. Wouldn't really think of taking Cam the Ram and making a linear combination with Brutus Buckeye. It's a strange kind of creature that you'd have to create from that sort of combination. So we refrain from treating this axis as being anything relevant to linear algebra. This is the nature of much of our data sets. Data can have data that's on one side treated as linear and on the other side not. We have some vocabulary we can use. I'll describe an axis as being linear when it admits reordering, rescaling, and combinations. It'll be inert if I simply ignore it, such as the train tables, or it might be combinatorial. It's a mix in between. Combinatorial would mean we can swap them or add and remove, but we don't deal with scaling Brutus or linking combinations.
Let's move to another example that's commonly thought of as a matrix, the adjacency matrix of a graph, or the node arc matrix. Here are two examples of ways to get data out of a graphical description. We simply number some of the parts based, for example, on their dimension. So in this case, we have zeros for the zero-dimensional objects, the nodes, and one-dimensional objects, the edges. You can also think of a tensor by adding two-dimensional objects, such as surfaces, between nodes. If we do this, we can create a grid. The grid has simply the adjacencies between the values of the nodes. So 1, 1 is 0, because in this picture, we don't have any loops going from 1 and ending in 1. But 1, 2 is non-zero, and in fact, that has the value of 1, because we have an edge there. Another alternative is we could n number these edges off, e1, e2, and e3, and simply put where they are incident, with 1s and minus 1s. In particular, when the graphs are directed, this is a natural model. Both of these are natural matrices in the sense that they're grids of numbers, but should they be called matrices in the sense of linear algebra? That's harder to assess. If we start taking linear combinations of these, we'll find that we have strange attitudes towards what the answer means. For example, if I row reduce this matrix here, I just add this to here and turn that into zero, now this no longer represents an edge. It's just some single value one, so there's no graph to go with it. Likewise, information over here can become positive and negative and mean various things as well. We've lost the obvious reason to do linear algebra on these matrices. For that reason, we should be cautious if we think of those examples as being naturally examples where we do linear algebra. We should refrain from calling them matrices until we know better. That said, many of you may have at this point taken enough material to know that there are some natural reasons to use linear algebra here. The most likely example is that if you take the adjacency matrix and square it, you end up with a matrix that describes all paths of length 2. You can do this in more general paths of length n. That's clearly an application of linear algebra. However, notice this is not a free will choice where you can do anything to the rows and anything to the columns. It's a very precisely chosen aspect of linear algebra, the power of the matrix A. Likewise, if I take the node arc matrix, those of you who have been around linear programming might recognize the ingredients of a pivoting algorithm. If we do row echelon form on a matrix to find some basic columns, this is our first step towards optimizing. For example, finding a maximum flow between two, a source and a sink, or finding a minimum cut, where is our network least robust? These are actually just pivoting algorithms using Gaussian elimination. However, it once more requires us to use that in tandem with an objective that we are trying to maximize by moving the pivoting around in a specific way. It's not simply free will linear algebra, apply any transformation you want. In all of those applications, we have to retain a basic set of columns. When you start to think of it this way, you recognize that the many applications of linear algebra on adjacency matrices and node art graphs and other representations have to be understood with very nuanced detail. They are not natural linear structures. They have only limited applications as compared to a general matrix where we can do anything we want. That's not to take away their value, but it's to emphasize that you use it correctly. These would not qualify as generically tensorial operations. They're very, very particular. So let's get to this famous example of the image tensor. There are plenty of linear algebra books that sell this as a matrix, or even use the word tensor. And there are many stories that are included, including JPEG compression, low rank approximations, and other information theoretic questions about images. But let's ask ourselves if we really understand what that means. We can take the rows and columns and take each pixel to be represented by numbers, so it's clear there is a grid of numbers. In that sense, we do again have a matrix. But is it a matrix in our real sense? Folks do linear algebra on it, but if we take an arbitrary linear transformation, just apply row swaps or rescaling, we will heavily distort the image and probably lose any meaningful information. We should once again not treat this as a matrix in that the rows and columns are used independently or in any way relevant to use an arbitrary transformation. It's only limited techniques that will apply to using this as a matrix. It is not therefore a general version of a tensor. Once again, there are mitigating circumstances. If you're trying to do things like low rank approximations, 
lowering the amount of information and still make it look visually the same, you can look to things like eigen theory. This is telling us about the directionality of our information. The larger the eigenvalue, the more prominent we're pointing in that direction. Not all matrices are square, and therefore not all matrices have eigenvalues, but the solution is straightforward. Take the transpose of your matrix and multiply it together, and look at the directionality of that product. It takes an extra step or two to convert this back to the original matrix description, but it is a valid way to put linear algebra back into the story of image data. Once more, it has to be understood through this lens. You cannot simply take arbitrary transformations and expect to get useful information. If you also look at examples like JPEG compression, then you're simply using the matrix as a vector in a very large space and changing to a new basis, a phase basis based on cosine and sines that approximates the same data. And then you can throw out the high frequency or very low frequency information that the eye can't really detect anyway. The image will look the same, but you store far less information. Keep in mind, there is linear algebra, but it would be unfair to consider this low-hanging fruit linear algebra. This also applies to images that are done in tensorial ways. If I do a video, I can think of each time slice as a different slice of a tensor, getting deeper and deeper. And so in this way, it is again a grid, a 3D tensor. And there is a lot of linear algebra applied. But we have to be careful that we don't do the obvious things. Those are not allowed. These are certainly not ways to think of a 3 tensor. Finally, perhaps the most popular relevant tensor of today is emerging out of information theoretic studies of neural networks. These have been used in biological settings for many years without any attempt to make them linear. However, as people build larger and larger systems, they want to use faster and faster algorithms, and linear algebra fits the bill. It's one of our fastest toolkits available. So when we see large systems of data that can be written with matrices, it's tempting to apply linear algebra. It might even be tempting to think about theoretical implications of neural networks through the lens of linear algebra. But here we need to understand what these tensors are even from. I won't go into the details of a neural network in this lecture, but the basic idea is that we start with values as input and values as output. We put in some test information. The test information is perhaps a graphic, and then a label describing it as a cat, or a dog, or a pig. We pass many of these training data sets through to create a graph. The graph is trying to reinforce where it is that certain information being passed along will reinforce the assessment that it is of a certain type, labeled as a cat. The image will be passed along these individual pixel points. This image is no longer rectangular. It's been flattened out as just an arbitrary vector. These values then are assigned with some arbitrary random values to begin with. They are then passed to a key step. A nonlinear combiner happens here. This step is either an arc tangent or a floor function or some other threshold function that can be computed efficiently. It takes the values that seem low in value and just simply drops them or elevates the higher values above their threshold. Whichever way it does this, the result is that the values after here are now the results of a linear combination over here together with a nonlinear combination. Now it's true that the data you need to store is only on these black lines. These are the values that we'll update. How much do we think this wire contributes to the final decision? However, this nonlinear part in between is what really matters to the interpretation. See, if I take this tensor and I start writing this linear transformation and do linear algebra across these slices, I'm skipping over a nonlinear function with linear functions. There's no reason for these two to have any relationship to each other. It is as if the individual slices are an inert axis. You should not be doing linear combinations of the first layer with the second layer unless you have a causal reason to see there's a relationship between them that is linear. Purposely in neural networks, the key idea is to have a nonlinear break. Otherwise, we would just simply multiply all these matrices together and describe the entire problem by a linear approximation. And that's nothing close to the, de the subtlety that nonlinear approximations can provide. So we'd lose the whole power of neural networks. So keep this in mind. When modeling information, you may create a useful data structure that gets stored as a grid. That does not mean you have the right to think of it as a tensor. It certainly doesn't let you do linear algebra on any axis you want. Linear algebra is a scalpel, not a hammer.
you need to know when you can actually apply it. If you take every grid of numbers and treat it as a tensor, you'll produce nonsense information. However, with work, you can turn almost any situation from graphs and hypergraphs and images and videos into meaningful linear algebra. Just don't do it till you've properly modeled the sentence, the questions as a linear question. But one last bit. Suppose you're working with somebody who wants to call everything inside a tensor. Go with it. There's no reason to create an argument over who's right. The point is to understand that there is a difference between axes that are attacked linearly and axes that can't be. Once you understand the difference, you know the limits of your theory. So if you need a distinction between somebody who's calling everything tensor and something else, perhaps use the word formal tensor. It's worth mentioning that the person who invented tensors, uh, Sir William Hamilton, did so to describe something completely unrelated to everything that's tensorial today. So we can't hold on to a word with the expectation that it'll always mean what we want it to mean. And with that, we'll close.